Hi, everybody. Today we are going to talk about a topic that most people want to talk about, but yet are hesitant to venture into. The topic for today is the entrepreneur. It is um, entrepreneurship is something that we always dreamt about from childhood, but we all want to think about it and brood over it. And by the time we take a call, the time has passed. So today we are going to we have a panel of speakers who are going to refer to this particular topic. From time immemorial, we have had a lot of people wanting to start their own business. It is an age-old um, phenomenon. It's an age-old theory that on your own you're better off. And today's day and age, there is a lot of financial difficulties. There's a lot lot of recession. Uh, Post COVID, people have realized that you could do a business from home. You could do a business from practically anywhere in the world. And post-COVID has brought this, uh, this aspect of life very, very much into the forefront. So we have, so today we have on our panel, Dan. Dan is co-founder Radical, as it says right here on the chart. He, is, um, he has been co-founder for Modern Survey too. We have Floyd, his director of Wellsprings. We have Pankaj, he's VP Analytics Loyaltics. We have Marcus, he's CEO Carrera. All of them have an ocean of knowledge. And why would I say that? It's because they are entrepreneurs themselves, running extremely successful, successful businesses, and none, none but them would be an authority, authority to speak on entrepreneurs. When you live as an entrepreneur, you're the best one to talk about it. So let's now look at what a famous saying by Warren Buffett. He says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. To me, it comes across as you, there is a price to pay to be an entrepreneur. You have, there are lots of risks. Do you want to take a risk? But then what is there at the end of the, at the, end of the rainbow? There's a value is what you get. So to me, this saying of Warren Buffett really stood out because every time we talk about entrepreneurship, we, we know there is an extreme price to be paid. So ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about this crucial topic that affects a lot of people and a lot of people would like to know more about it. So today on our agenda is definition of and why a startup. How to identify a good and viable startup idea. Passion and doable balance, skill or non-skill core. Then we're gonna talk about the startup balance sheet and then different business models and where will the money come from? Think big, start small mergers and acquisitions. And there's going to be, as the presentation pro, uh, carries along, each speaker would probably have a, give a passing reference to laws of the land. We have simplified all these, the, um, the agenda, to make it as layman as possible. So ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Floyd, the patents, all yours. Claude, you're muted. Claude, we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Now we can hear you. All right, great. So like Bissy started it by saying that we are living in different times, which makes it significant because when you live in different times, you need to change the paradigms which were operating in the, new, in the old system and get into paradigms which can take you through the current scenarios. So as an introduction, I'm Floyd Almeida. 
me and my brother run an organization called Wellsprings, which was established in March 2006. That's 17 years we've been at it. I have been in employment. I've recently joined him three years ago. And what we do is we work with individuals, schools, colleges, as well as corporates. And our mission is we empower people and organizations create value, both for themselves and their communities, because at the end of the, end of the day, value is something to be shared. And how do we do this? By co-creating ecosystems which support positive mental health. We've re been reading a lot about mental health. We've been reading about the importance of mental health, both for individuals and the communities in which they operate. And what has happened is that we have seen a real growth in this area and the need for our services. So I'm happy to say our contributions are adding value. Now, we have been talking about entrepreneurship. What exactly is entrepreneurship? So let's understand the current context in which many of us who are employed are there. Now, it is Warren Buffet who said that if your salary is your only source of income, you're one step away from poverty. And that is something which is a paradigm we seriously need to think of. Many of us who are employed usually have only one source of income. Maybe we do dabble in the stock markets. We do have certain incomes coming through you know, mutual funds, et cetera, or we have certain assets which are on rent. But that is really not enough if we are really looking at our salary being 80% or more of our incomes. So in this scenario, would you consider a startup? And that's the purpose of what we are going to be speaking about today. My colleagues will definitely be sharing all their examples and their lived in experiences, as would I. And the important thing for all of us to realize is that while we are sharing our experiences with you, okay, we are not recommending that you do exactly what we do because you are living in your own individual context. You have your own individual dreams, lifestyles, and circumstances. However, we are here to help you make an informed decision, which is relevant for your context, your dreams, and your current situation. So please don't take what we say as something you must do without application of mind and application of principles. So to continue with that, why would we consider entrepreneurship? Going by what we said earlier, that if your salary is your only source of in income, you are one step away from poverty. I mean, how relevant is this in the current context? So let's see what's been happening in the first quarter of this year. In the first quarter of this year, these are the top 10 companies in terms of global presence, right? And look at the number of jobs they have laid off in the last 90 days. In fact, this report is relevant till March 25th of 2023. And you can see that these companies, 10 companies have laid off 104,000 people in 85 days, which is 1,200 layoffs per day. And these 10 are not the only companies in the world. You know what's happening in your area, you know what's happening in your community, in your industry, in your organization. So the thing of lifelong employment is no longer a reality. So it's time for you to think about could this situation impact you soon or is it far off or is it sufficiently strong enough for you to consider entrepreneurship? So let's understand what do we mean by the word entrepreneur before we decide whether we want to consider entrepreneurship. Okay, this is a French word, which has been attributed to the French economist Jean-Baptiste Say. And it's a combination of two words, the French entrepreneur and English enterprise. So entrepreneur in French means somebody who undertakes projects, somebody who's also called an adventurer because he's managing risks and he's not moving into areas. He's sometimes charting unknown waters. So the word entrepreneur came around the 17th, 18th century, and the person is defined or looked at as a capitalist and a risk taker. Now, what do we mean by that? So an individual who creates new business, bearing most of the risk and enjoying most of the rewards. And then he's co commonly seen as an innovator, a source of new ideas, goods, services, etc. So either you are finding new solutions to existing problems or 
you are finding new ways to address what's happening or you are finding new needs. So either new needs, which you will address, which people themselves have not identified. As Ford said, if he asked his customers, what do if the customers were asked, what do they want? They would always say they wanted a faster horse. But he had to understand that need and provide them with his Ford, T Ford model, right? So that's the difference. So you find new needs or you find new ways of addressing current needs. Having said that, Visi, could you please provide them with the poll on entrepreneurship? Hello, Bissy. Yes, I'm just going to launch it. All right. Thank you. Will it launch? Thank you, Bissy. The question says How many of you have become full time entrepreneurs? since January 2021. That is when the pandemic was at its start and really creating confusion. So you may choose to stay employed. You may want to be an entrepreneur. You already are an entrepreneur, or maybe you are undecided. We'd like to know what's your current state or what you've done in the past. We'd encourage you to vote. Okay, that's encouraging. We have people in the audience who want to be entrepreneurs. Fair enough. Being undecided is not a bad choice. You need to be clear about why you want to be an entrepreneur and how you want to go about it. Okay. Uh, Floyd, I think I uh, all the questions have come together. So just sticking, you're sticking to just one question being answered. Yes, right? I'm sticking to the first one. Okay, okay. just mention that. Yeah. So we'll right now we'll just reference to the first question, which is how many of you have become full time entrepreneurs since Jan 2021? Okay. Some people prefer to stay employed, which is also a wise choice, because when you're an entrepreneur. Timing and preparation are critical. Okay. So I, I think, think two minutes. Everyone's answered all the questions, so you could probably. Yeah. So we can move on. So it's interesting to see that there are people who want to be entrepreneurs. Uh, we will share with you our experiences and what we've done. So no one is yet an entrepreneur. So this would be the right place you've come to at the right time. Okay, so let's move forward from there. Thank you, Bessie. So what is a startup? Now, if you are an entrepreneur, when you start your own organization or you're providing a service or a product, a company or a business in the first stages of its operation. So many of you who want to be entrepreneurs, once you start operating in that context, your organization would be called a startup. Now, for startups, this is the statistics. Very interesting set statistics, which says 70% of them survive for the least two years, 50% last five years. So usually 50% of them have moved on and probably people have changed their minds because it's not providing or proving to be financially viable. And only 25% make it to 15 years, more than 15 years. So it's interesting. So we hope that our experiences shared with you would help you make up your minds and also help you to plan for the future. Now, there are two ways you can look at your entrepreneurship outcomes. Either, like it says in this cartoon, you will be a person who will be bothered by customers, your core team, the employees you have, the team you create, both the investors who have provided you with funding 
and the people who are important in your life, your wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, family, whoever it is, people who are significant others in your life. Or you go beyond this for the first two or three years because you live the first few years of your life as an entrepreneur like most people won't. It would reflect what's on the left-hand side. But after that, once you've established and once you moved it forward, you can spend the rest of your life like many people can't. And that is something we would like to share with you as well. We belong to the other half of it. And then we can move forward and share that with you. So moving on to entrepreneurship, I'm speaking about the experience of me and my brother at Wellsprings. It's important to know that anyone can start a business, but not everyone will succeed. Now, what are the benefits of being an entrepreneur? The definite benefit is you live your dreams. You can largely live your life on your terms. You choose what's important for you. You set your priorities. Of course, this also means that you have a lot of self-confidence, commitment to making your dream come true. There's a lot of hard work and discipline. So if things have to be done, it's not something you can just delegate and forget about it because at the end, the buck stops with you. The other advantage is you do experience success. I have not mentioned unlimited success because, of course, there will be ups and downs. You will have days of great success. You would have great days of great frustration when you think you are up against a wall. But that's what entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship is all about. You will definitely have unlimited learning. You will learn from everyone. And you have to have that humility to learn from the most junior person in your team because they will have a different perspective which could add value to what you're doing. At the same time, you could learn from people who give you feedback which you might not like or you may even not agree with. So unlimited learning is there if you want to learn. That attitude for learning becomes significant. Finally, a force for good because you can add value to yourself, your family, your communities. It makes a big difference. For example, I can tell you in our current situation, we, had, we were dealing with students. We had a, a student who would continuously fail in maths. But when we worked with that particular student and we got down to his self-concept, the way he see them, we created an ecosystem around him to encourage, which included his parents and siblings. We are happy to say that today he is one of the top students in his class, which is grade nine in maths. In fact, he has won a math scholarship. So, you know, you cannot measure everything in financial terms. Sometimes the satisfaction you get from touching people's lives and helping them improve and helping them see themselves differently as more powerful, more outgoing, it makes a big difference to you yourself. And finally, flexibility and accountability, which is extremely critical because you are the top decision maker, nothing changes. You cannot bl blame other people for the decisions you've taken. Example, it does become difficult sometimes to take decisions with people when the pandemic struck us. It was difficult for us to let people go who had been with us for so many years. But having said that, it was the right decision to make both for themselves so they could find something that would be financially viable. And also for us so that we could keep the business going for the others who we needed urgently. So it, these are difficult situations to make. However, you need to do it humanely. So even when we let people go, we first help them circulate their CVs, we contacted our own friends, our clients, our customers who could use their skills. Happy to say that all of them found jobs. Many of them have continued in those jobs. A few of them have returned back to us because they enjoyed what they are doing. But when you have to make hard decisions, sometimes the right decision is not the easy decision. So that's part of entrepreneurship. Having said that, what are the downsides or the risks that we would consider? There's no guaranteed income. We decided to go without any loan from others or investments. We decided to go through it on our own financial steam. And this is because there are two elements to it. The moment you get investors, whether they are angel investors or whatever, what happens is to the extent that you get other people in, you lose that extent of control. And you also have to share your rewards or your profits. So if you want to go in for investments from others yes it does help you get more advice you also get 
to start off on your dream earlier since you have the funds. But the downside is you also don't have 100% control over decisions. And at the same time, you are not also 100% uh, uh, access to the profits. Uncertainty, possibility of failure, you always have to look at the feedback that you are getting because you need to use that to either reinvent or reposition yourselves. It doesn't mean that you're going to fail. It just means that your idea is not right for the needs in the market or for your customer segment. This, in my opinion, is the most important thing because if you don't take care of your health or your relationships with the people who matter to you, you are going to affect everything. Because in the end, even if you fail or if you decide to do things differently, these are the people who will stand by you and help you bounce back. So at my serious advice, you can take this from me, is do not sacrifice your health or your relationships for your business, for your dream. It's not worth it. Because if you lose health and relationships, there's very little you've got to bounce back and reposition and recover. So please don't go and sacrifice this. There are some times you have to accept it's not the right time. You start with an idea. It doesn't work. You have to hold back. Uh, in our situation, uh, as we were going through, we got initially schools who wanted us to help them when they saw the uh, results with individual students. But at that time, we were not ready because we didn't have the staff. We didn't have the bandwidth also in terms of how we wanted to go about it because we would be spreading ourselves too thin. We held back for about 16 months. We put a plan together, put our resources together, and then we moved forward. And happy to say now that we do assist a lot of schools, right from teachers to principals to student seminars to help us go forward. So you have, don't uh, let your ego come in the way of your dream because your ego is a definite dream killer. So if it's not the right time, accept it and plan forward, do a lot of dream aligned projects. Like we continue to work on a pro bono basis and many times we offered free seminars, free workshops, trainings, et cetera, just so that we would understand better what the market wanted us to do. So this is our experience in terms of the benefits and the risk which we faced as we moved into the entrepreneurship industry. Basically, could you please release uh, Poll two, or we could have a look at the views on uh, feedback on fourth poll two. Yes, Floyd, one second, okay? Sure, sure. Thank you. It's up. So, yeah, thank you. So in terms of benefits, I think a lot of people talk about living their dream. That's true. We've got 50% there uh, out of the people who voted. We've got another three out of six in flexibility and accountability. Yes, that's really encouraging to say because you have to be prepared to make the tough decisions as you go forward. In fact, that's one of the key requirements of an entrepreneur, the ability to be decisive. We'll touch on that later. And then what has been your great, greatest challenge? Yes, income is the real challenge. So it's important for you to really plan forward in terms of ideally, if you can have 18 months of uh, savings to take you through your basic needs for the first 18 months, if you don't have that, my suggestion is don't venture into being an entrepreneur. Don't kind of you know bet on the house. Because as they say, nobody tests the depth of the water with both feet. So hold on to that. Make sure you are financially sound to take it at least of your basic needs with uh, your finances. Uncertainty, possibility of failure, that is true. Uh, the important thing which I would suggest, in fact, when we went forward, is that the people who supported us and who meant a lot to us in our relationships, in this case, our spouse, our children, parents and significant others, they, we all shared the same vision and the same passion to achieve this result of helping people across and creating value through mental health. So it's very important that they share your vision and your passion because when things go bad, 
you don't have people coming to you and say, I told you so, you should not have gone there, see what you've done to us, see what you've done to the kids and the family, etc. It's important that you and the people who you value and the relationships you value are with you even when you hit the bottom. Because there will be a time, I won't say necessarily you'll hit the bottom, but every day is not going to be a success. Things are going to change as you go along. So make sure that the people who are with you are the people who share your passion and your dream and will support you when you have your stormy days because there will be stormy days. Thank you, Visi. Moving forward with that, I'd like to share with you a Harvard study which shared what are the characteristics and other elements of an uh, entrepreneur. Now, in the case of curiosity, you have to be curious, you have to watch trends, you have to look out for opportunities. If you have a great idea, test it out through structured experiments. A great idea does not necessarily mean that idea has a need for which people will pay you. You have to test it out in the market. You have to be ready to pivot and adapt. Like when COVID hit us, we found it difficult to connect with people because contacts were difficult, public uh, interactions were stopped, and then we had to pivot, although we did take some time, to technology, to using Zoom, using other elements to connect with people. And in fact, now, given the fact that in some countries and some places, uh, going for a mental health uh, discussion is considered taboo, we have now found Zoom to be an important part of our business because people in the privacy of their homes can contact you over Zoom and discuss everything that they, they want to discuss. So that has, in fact, that pivot has been very useful for us going forward. Decisiveness, like I said earlier, you got to take the tough decisions. It's critical to be confident. I'll come to that a little later, because if you don't believe that you can deliver your customers, if they smell it, then obviously they are not going to invest in you and neither are your clients going to take you forward and recommend you to their friends. So word of mouth will be dead. Team building, you don't have all the skills. You need people who have complementary skills to take you forward. Risk tolerance, you have to have an appetite because not everything is going to be as successful as you planned. On the flip side, not everything will be a failure like you anticipated to, to be because reality and imagination are not consistent. So you have to look forward for where you, like they say, worry is the abuse of your imagination. So be careful with that. Comfortable with failure, which extends from risk tolerance, persistence when you don't achieve what you plan to achieve, but you stick to the knitting and go forward. Innovation, new ways of doing current things or finding new needs. And you have to have a long-term focus because it's a long game. Going to the next, there are some people who said they were not ready and that's a wise decision. You have to be very clear why, 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 because you have to be very clear what you want to contribute and why do you want to do that? Like I said earlier, the idea and the opportunity need to meet. You have to look at, are you willing to adapt quickly? Do you have, looking back on your past uh, situations, have you moved quickly and changed or have you continued and took time to change? Your past is an indicator of how you would function as an entrepreneur. Finance and funding, important decision to make depending on the extent of control and profits you want to share. Courage to fail, timing is critical. If you are not ready yet, then get ready in terms of doing, like I said earlier, dream aligned projects. These skills are definitely important. At the end of the day, finance is the language of business. You need to understand finance. Networking is critical as Howard says, your network, your network is your net worth because the people who you know would then connect you with others who have a need for your skills or for the product or service that you are providing. And word of mouth is the best kind of advertising you can have. Act on feedback, don't waste time. Even if it's feedback you don't agree with, look at what are the elements you can take from that and move forward. Pattern recognition, check for trends. Strategic thinking, like we said earlier, long-term focus. You need to know how to negotiate because everybody is out to get the most they can for the least they can pay. So you have to be very clear on what is it that you are going for. A growth mindset because there's going to be failure. You have to keep learning and you have to have the ability to adapt. 
Now, if you look at all these, the ones I've highlighted with red, they all come down to two things, having confidence in yourself and having the courage to fail. Because only you can get the courage to fail only if you have the confidence that you have the ability, in other words, the growth mindset to learn from your failures, make changes and to bounce back up again. So the core is this, courage, confidence and a growth mindset. Moving forward, if you look at the big issues that it would take in terms of the ideal system in what you would like to do, what, what you would be looking for, are my goals well-defined? Then do I have the right strategy, which becomes critical? And then you move forward with that. So the culture of discipline and entrepreneurship. Without decisiveness and discipline, entrepreneurship does not succeed. Moving next, this is an interesting business model canvas, which I suggest you can look at later, where it starts with your value proposition. You have to be very clear what is it that you're going to provide and why and how will you measure your success. Once you know what is the value you are going to provide, which is usually based on the talents you have or the talents you have discovered, which are useful for people, you then identify your customer segments and then your channels, how you will provide them with this product or service. You also then look on the left-hand side, which is who are the people who can help you? Because obviously you will not have all the resources, be it talent, be in finance, whatever it is. So how you can connect with key partners, what are the key resources you need from them, and what are the key activities you will do in order that you will then marry your resources with your abilities to deliver value to your customers. And finally, at the end of everything, what's critical is how you look at your cost structure and how you look at your finance streams. In short, this is a very good business model canvas, which I would recommend, which I have used, which helps you clarify your thoughts. And it's not something you do in one afternoon. It's something you revisit regularly. I would suggest, you know, if, you, if you're deciding, just visit it for two weeks every day. It will help you clarify your thinking. And then once you've done it, share it with people who you trust uh, and who you believe have the ability to help you clarify your thinking. It is very useful to get feedback because very often we have our own blind spots and bias, which other people who we trust can help us to clarify. Finally, as we move forward, or once you kind of get started, then a good idea is very often quickly copied. <clears throat> and many people get lost again in trying to provide more products to new customer segments. But the fact of the matter is, that it is easier for you to retain a customer than to find a new customer or a new client. So the old saying goes, the customer is king to the extent where he does not make you <coughs> sell your, your principles. So the customer is king, yes, but there is a boundary. So set your boundaries, decide how you can add more value to your customer, and then keep focusing. So even if you have one product, Focus on the customer experience. Focus on retaining the people you have because they are going to be your word of mouth to help get you more customers, more people. So with that, I hope I have been able to give you different paradigms and different thoughts from our experiences to help you plan your entrepreneurship journey. And with this, I hand it over to my colleague, Pankaj Sharma, and to Bisi to take it forward. It was a pleasure sharing with you my experience. Thank you, Floyd. Uh, this was indeed a really interesting and informative presentation. Thank you. So uh, I'll just start sharing my screen. Please let me know once you are able to uh, yeah. see my screen. You need I, to. You yep, need to. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Yep. I, I hope I am visible and audible uh, as well. Yes, you are. Perfect. All right, cool, thank you. All right, so um, uh, my name is Pankaj and today I'm going to talk about finding the right product market fit. Um, but before I start my presentation, right, I would want to start with a story. This is a story of perseverance. This is a story of innovation. This is a story of commitment. So the story starts uh, in 2007, uh, two gentlemen named Brian and Joe 
um, in San Francisco, they 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 picked up a problem. They were they saw that in San Francisco there are some conferences happening, and a lot of people are not able to find uh, good hotel rooms, or in fact, not able to find any hotel room for that matter. And they thought about it, and they uh, decided to solve the problem. Right? They jumped into providing the air mattresses and some breakfast to the hosts, uh, to to the to the guests, and uh, called it a business and uh, started with the idea. But the idea did not work well in the beginning. What did they do? They thought, okay, it's time for us to maybe dig deep in. And they went to went uh, went and checked back with their customers, their existing uh, small customer base. And what they figured out is that a lot of customers were complaining in terms of the photos or images of the property which was listed is taken by the owner himself. Hence, uh, not visible, not showcasing the the prime, um, or I should say the best parts of the property, not even describing the property well. And in fact, there were some trust issues as well, right? So when we say trust issues, usually it was it is about reviews and star ratings and all. And they figured it out. Obviously, they listened to their customers and solved for it. Fast forward to this day, this is Airbnb, which is now having 7 million plus listings in around 220 countries. And is obviously pioneer in its own uh, in, in, the, in the field it is operating. So think about it. Do you think this is a story of Airbnb where they had an excellent or a very novel idea? Perhaps no, right? Uh, I mean, before Airbnb, there were a lot of people who were renting out their places uh, to travelers on a for a short duration. Was it about execution? Yeah, it could be because execution is most important. Or was it just a sheer luck? So today we are not going to talk about the ideas. Why? Because the idea is 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 to an individual. Idea is what you will have in your mind, basis your perception of your world, basis the conditioning that you have gone through, or basis the problems that you're seeing around you. Obviously, we cannot talk about luck and destiny here on this forum, but we will definitely talk about how do you execute those ideas. What are the frameworks you should look for to execute an idea or work towards a solution so that it becomes a good and a viable product in the market? So before I do that, I just want to take uh, 30 minutes, 30 seconds, sorry, uh, to just introduce myself formally and also about my organization. So my name is Pankaj Sharma. I am working in Loyalytics as a VP of Analytics. I have around 13 years of experience into data science, consulting, into managing clients and stakeholders. And I'm a person who is always interested in new technology. I'm always interested in businesses and solving business problems. I am part of Loyalytics, which is a data and AI based organization. And what do we do? We have some SaaS products where the only objective that we look for is solve our clients' problems which are based on data, help them execute and take decisions which are driven by driven and backed by the data. So yeah, that's about me and the organization. Let's jump into the topic. But before that, give me one, one more second to talk about my clients, right? So if you look at my clients, right? Uh, so we have a diverse range of clients. We have clients into uh, who, are, who are into retail space. We are primarily focused into the Middle East region. If you look at uh, some of the big brands that you on your screen, uh, which is like Lulu Retail in, in UAE, Panda Retail in, in Saudi Arabia and Spa Retail as well, right? We are also working with some of the American clients, US-based clients, uh, Sleep Number and Cisco, which are in US and they are uh, a tech-based uh, clients for us. Um, so before I go ahead, uh, Bisi, could you please shoot the poll? Just want to check how uh, our audience, uh, what is the view of our audience on this? Let's have a poll. Yeah, just uh, let me just release it. Yeah, so the question here for, for everyone of us is, um, what is the most important thing or a must have 
to identify if it's a good uh, idea for a startup? What would you say? Is it the timing of the product or the service that you're thinking? Is it the target market understanding? Is it a good team or is it the traction in terms of how many subscribers or maybe how many how many clientels do you have and so on? Okay, I think uh, majority, I think right now, two responses I got on target market. Okay, so saying good team. Okay, all right, a good team and a target market understanding seems like the obvious choice here. Okay, 50% of the people are on the team side, that's good. Right, I think we will have a tie between yeah, a tie. And, and a good team. Great, I, Bessie, I think we can end the poll. I think I should let me yes. move forward. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you, audience, for the uh, for the um, for the poll participation. Let's jump uh, into uh, the topic, right? So, as all of you, I think most of you um, were uh, uh, have responded on team and and total market understanding, which we call here as TAM, which is a total addressable market. And I would say, yeah, I think the I think uh, you have picked up the best of the two. Uh, like uh, Floyd also mentioned, right? So we are. We are not here to tell you what is the exact approach or what is the exact right way you should do it. But what we are aiming to do is talk about some of the uh, some of the dimensions or aspects what we felt uh, are important, and we hope really hope that these will help you also. So let's talk about the uh, four T's here, right? So when we talk, when we say uh, how how do I identify? How do I say that my idea is a good idea? It's a sellable idea. Uh, and when I go to the VC, how do I know that they are also going to like my idea and invest in it, right? So I would say when you are thinking about this, the good uh, the good way of doing it is uh, you flip the idea, you flip the whole situation, and think that if I am a VC, what all will I look for in a, in an or in a startup to invest my money into, and that will give you a glimpse of some really interesting thoughts, right? So let's say we talk about team, right? So people will say that, okay, having a, having a very strong team or a very powerful team of very smart individual is the key to it. But some would say, no, it is not the key to it. The key to it is diversity, right? Imagine you are uh, in a, in a, working in an IT company and you have a team of very strong uh, IT developers, right? But they all are developers. Will that business work? They may be very strong in developing a very good product, but identification of the market, or let's say marketing and selling the product, they might not do so well, right? So sooner or later, they will have to find a co-founder who is good in selling, who is good in marketing the product, right? So diversi diversifying the ideas, the thoughts is, is really key. Then we talk about, let's say, total addressable market, right? Uh, when we say total addressable market, let's say you are thinking of a product, you have an idea in mind, and what you also understand from, let's say, a lot of market researchers and all that, okay, there's a 10 million, um, 10 million market there, and I can probably address 10%, and it, is, it, it comes around 10, $1 million, right? Do you think it's worth pursuing is what you need to think? Versus if, let's say, there's a huge market, and even the smallest share is what you can look to grab, that is much more interesting and that is much more, I would say, um, I would say a much more uh, better idea to pursue, right? So then you, you must have a very clear understanding on the market that is there and also how much of it you can address. The third point would be on the timing, right? So the timing they say is, is all. So when we, when we looked at the Airbnb story, right? Uh, was it the timing that really worked for them? I would say yes and no also, right? So sometimes some products are really dependent on technology. They may do really well on, on certain time, but really fail if they are launched ahead in time. Some of the examples we can take is, let's say a smartwatch, right? It was launched in 2004 by Microsoft, but didn't work, didn't, didn't do any good or didn't uh, fail to, uh, and failed completely to, to capture the market, right? What was the reason? It was 
during that time there were no they were the microprocessors were not that evolved the sensors were not that evolved even the machine learning technology to support was not that evolved if you look at the uh, if you look at now right smart watches everywhere right it is present uh, i mean even uh, at different age groups different uh, type of people everybody is using a smart watch right so then timing also plays a critical role and then comes to the uh, to that comes traction right so when we say traction what does this mean this means how many existing subscriber how many existing clients how many existing uh, customers do you already have before you even think of going to a vc right so when let's say there is a good traction that you have already uh, with your product you have tested it at least to some level in the market that would give a very high confidence to a vc uh, in investing your to your investing in your organization right so when you say okay i already have some customers let's say maybe a small base but i know these all are my happy customers these all are customers who are patrons to me right and that works um, that it really helps in convincing the vcs right okay um all right moving on so what is a product market fit right so in terms of mark andreessen he says the life of any startup can be divided into two parts one is before market fit and one is after market fit and i will show you in in the consequent slides that how your growth or how your traction will look completely different once you have achieved a proper product market fit now when we talk about a product market fit what is it basically it is basically about understanding your icps as we say icp is nothing but your your ideal customer profile that means how well do you know the customers or the or the users of your product or your solution that means you understand the solution that you are building for your customers and you also understand who is going to use it who is who is in in most pain and who is the customer who is who would be really really willing to give your product a try these days a lot of entrepreneurs fall into the trap of what i call as a uh, love affair with the solution right uh, what is it what is it it is basically that you build a good solution but you do not think about the users of the solution you say i have built a fantastic solution on a very great idea but i really don't know who is going to use it and you get into a trap of continuously developing that idea continuously developing their solution without even thinking the same amount of effort or putting same amount of uh, deliberation on what your customer looks like right so that is important now and that's why they say right if you are don't if you don't have product market mix uh, product market fit basically you are just spinning your wheels now let's define product market fit right so i will not go into the definition a lot more but i here i would say how loyaltix has defined it right for us if i have to talk about loyaltix so loyaltix define itself as an organization who can help any client who has the data with them but does not have a capability to process or make meaning out of it who is looking for a value based solution and a complete commitment to generate uh, in generating values so these this is what i i think we define our prof customer profile right this is how we say that anyone who is in need of of let's say data understanding or building data layers or using of ai and machine learning we are there to help so that's that's what drives loyaltix in terms of its icps let's look at some of the cases of uh, historical product market fits right so we look at like let's say mcdonalds founded in 1956 really clicked the idea really worked uh, this was the time when there was a real need for fast foods right where people were really looking for something that they don't need to sit in a diner spend too much of time but quickly get done with 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 their hunger and move on right and which clicked and which is a history now right um, similarly apple Uh, here apple uh, when it was launched there was not even a, a direct uh, need which was there there was not even a stated need so apple was catering to latent needs so as i said when you are catering to the market it could also be latent need it could also be the need need which is stated by by the by the by the by your customers right and rest is obviously the history 
coming to the best practices on the product market fit, right? So here we talk about first understanding the ICPs, as I mentioned, right? So you need to understand exactly the customer profiles. In fact, you have to go to a level of understanding their personas. Why personas also? Because let's say you want to solve the problem of traffic, right? right? Traffic is there everywhere in the world, right? But whose traffic problem do you want to solve? Is it that, let's say in my city, Bangalore, India, you want to solve traffic problem? If yes, then who is your uh, uh, customer or who is your user, right? Is it the people who are commuting on a daily basis or commuting for office needs or commuting for some other needs, right? Are you want, do you want to solve specifically for, let's say, IT folks, people working in IT industries? Do you want to solve for an, any specific area in, in, let's say, Bangalore? And you have to go till that level. You have to have 100% clarity on who is exactly am I going to help with my product, right? And then obviously doing the research on it. Once you figure out that, okay, this is my ICP, this is at least my initial level of ICPs, and these are the people whom I'm going to help initially. You need to obviously uh, test the waters. You need to first understand what all issues they're facing with, let's say your first MVP, as we say, uh, minimum viable product, right? And if that works out well, good for you. If it doesn't work, for, work out, then obviously there's a lot of learnings for you to take. And then you also need to then make elaborate tests as well, do elaborate testing also. So I remember I, when I was working for one of my automobile client, right, uh, which is again not a startup, it's a huge organization. Uh, even before launching their product, new car, uh, they were testing out with focused groups, right? They will invite a lot of customers, tell them to drive, tell them to sit on front seat, back seat, and just try it out, right? And give their very honest and very candid opinion. So even big organization obviously rely on uh, launch, on on a lot of customer feedbacks before they even before they even launch the product, right? So obviously it's very important. Now, uh, basically, can we have a poll again? The second one. Yes. So what I'm going to do is ask one more question uh, to you, which is around how do I measure my product success? What are what are the what what would be the best way to measure it, right? I'm going to. Yeah. Okay, let's wait till, yeah. Okay, it's up now. So what we are talking here about is, is do I look at my product as, by evaluating as how satisfied my customers are when they are using it, or by evaluating how dissatisfied they are if they do not get to use it, right? So presence of my product, how much it impacts my customer or absence of my product, how much it makes them unhappy. So what would you what would you say on this? Okay, I got one answer. It says okay, evaluating how satisfied they are. Great. I think. Uh, can we move forward, Bissy? Yes. All right. I think majority of uh, I, I think the polls out and, and it says majority of of you believe that how satisfied the customer is, which uh, in fact is not believed to be true by a lot of industry experts. And there is a test which people uh, usually refer to called Sean Ellis test. What it tells is basically is you should not look for how satisfied your customer customers are, right? Because the absence of something and the consequent dissatisfaction of that is what really measures your product success. So it's also called a golden 40% rule where it says, it's, it's a very simple test, it says, um, and it was, I think, done uh, sometime, uh, some years back uh, where they did this test on a lot of uh, hundreds of startups uh, and their products. So it says, um, you have to give your customers an option saying that how disappointed would you be if you could no longer use my product? Would you be very dissatisfied? Would you be somewhat dissatisfied or you would be like, okay, if I don't care if it is not there, right? So now imagine this or put this test in the perspective of let's say iPhone, right? I am pretty sure a lot of your day-to-day -day activities can still be managed if you don't have your iPhone you have maybe an Android phone or maybe some other phone, but you would still be very dissatisfied if you don't get to use your phone, iPhone, right? 
So that is the key to success, right? So if so it says if if more than 40% of your customers say that they are, they would be very dissatisfied if they do not get to use your product or service, that means you are really on the right track. And that means that the product is most likely to succeed. So that's about Sean Ellis test. And as I was saying, right, how does the success look like when you achieve product market fit, right? So the 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 curve, if you look, right, it's a typical uh, hockey stick curve, right, uh, where you see exponential growth in terms of revenue, in terms of subscribers, in terms of your clients, right? Once you have achieved that that one product market fit, right? Now, I would also want to talk about a few of the cues that you can take uh, in terms of understanding if you are on the right track. Now, these are not, uh, by any means, these are not st industry standards or these are not recommended statistics, but these are just cues that you could look for. For example, a customer product company, if it says um, out of seven days, three uh, three days my customer uses my product. So he is not missing my product. He is uh, He's, he's completely involved in it, right? That's a good sign. You say, I get organic signups on my website, on my application, which is driven without any social media, without any marketing, mass marketing and so on, right? That's a good sign. You say 30% of my users are active the same day they sign up. So that means they are not pushed by the marketing, but actually feel interested or feel value in using your product or application. And then, you, if you are if you are having a clear path to your to let's say 100 100,000 100k users right that is these are the signals that you could pick and say okay i have now achieved a product market fit and how does it look uh, when we talk about a saas based product right something like we say 5% conversion rate from free to paid so most of the b2c um, saas products work on on a free subscription basis and then gets translated to paid version right so if you are getting that conversion rate you are on right track. If you say my LTV to cost per acquisition, right, my CSC is around three times, right, three to one. That means you are on right track because basically what you're saying is I am not shelling out too much of money to get a customer who is not who is too less of worth, right. So again, that is important and that is a very strong signal. And then you say my churn rate is mostly below two percent, and you also have a hundred thousand dollars monthly recurring revenue path, right? These are some of the cues that you will tell you that, okay, my product or my services are doing good, yep. Now, uh, I also thought of uh, talking about uh, how we have done it. I think pretty much uh, we are a 120 member strong team right now, uh, and, and we feel we are, we are kind of on the right track. But I think that would not give you sufficient learning. What will give you a good learning is if I talk about some of our failures. So one such failure that we have seen or witnessed uh, in the last few years is about is about a product called Infuse. Infuse was our product, which was around social media analytics. So a customer would deploy it. It will help you understand the trend sentiments going on Twitter about your product or about your service. It will also track Facebooks and all other Instagrams, all, all other media platforms, gives you a very good report, helps you take preventive or corrective actions and so on. Now, what went wrong, right? We had an excellent, or I should say, a powerful team of five engineers, but still didn't work. It didn't work because we later realized that the team of five engineers, only engineers will not work. We should have got a product owner or a product manager there, right? Some Someone who could, could have just steered the direction for the team, saying what features to get uh, involved, to have in your product, what features to just ignore. Right? Where do we sell it? Whom do we sell it? Is it really solving the problem? Such questions were kind of unanswered by, by the team of five engineers. And we also made a mistake in terms of understanding or let's say really focusing on, on our ICPs, right? Um, so in a typical B2, B2B kind of a business, right? Uh, we, we know that there are a lot of stakeholders involved, right? For example, if you are building a product which is centered around data, would you sell it to a uh, a, a C CMO, would you sell it to a CFO, right? They probably won't be aware or won't be interested in doing uh, the talks with you, right? But would you sell it to CIO? Yes, definitely, right? He is the one who is interested in infrastructure. He's the one who is interested in on the data movement and so on and so forth, right? So you need to really understand who is your 
uh, who's your key customer and whose feedback really matters. In some way or other, we miss that part, right? We were listening to many people at many times. We were adding so many features, uh, basis feedbacks, and hence it, uh, end of the day, it, it just became a mashup of things, right? And we had to kind of literally scrape it, right? So yeah, I think, but but yeah, having having scraped it, I think it was it was a tremendous learning for us, tremendous uh, understanding of all the things that you should not do to make your product successful. Now coming to the most, I think, uh, most interesting um, talk for today, maybe for my presentation as well. How do you get the money, and when should you get the money? Right. Um, the way I wanted to approach this, right, I would say there is no right time or right approach to this. However, having said this, I, would, I have still put up this infographic for you to probably get a, a very high level sense of direction in terms of when do you get uh, in when do you get more people involved, right? If I have to talk about loyalties, we are a 120 member team, still a bootstrap. We have not raised a single money, right? But that's not I'm suggesting or recommending at, at this moment, right? What I'm saying is you need to find your own path. Why? Because your own path will depend on so many factors. It will depend on how fast you want to grow, let's say, right? It will also depend on what are your objectives, let's say your short term, your medium term, your long term goals, right? Um, what kind of industry are you working? What kind of problems you're solving, right? So it will depend on all those factors. But having said this, let's look at how it ideally goes or how it is going for most of the people, right? So obviously you start up as all alone, you have some idea, then you think of getting or onboard and co-founder where you say, okay, he will share my work, will also bring some new thinking, will also bring, bring new skills, right? Uh, in case of Airbnb, we know uh, Brian and Joe started, then Nathan got added, both Brian and Joe being from the design and and a business background, but Nathan being from more from IT background, more a tech, techie kind of person, right? Added to the added to the I would say mix of things, right? Uh, spices of the things, spices of things, right? For them, and then you you obviously start gaining, uh, building the product. You may need some, you may need to build up team for that. You may want to raise some money. Initial money can come from family, friends, angel investors, and so on. Once you have established, let's say, a roadmap to your product market fit or you have understood that, okay, I have tested my product, now I'm pretty confident, I have some traction, you go for your seed rounds, right? You go for maybe series A, B, C kind of funding. And obviously when the product market fit is completely achieved, you can go for the IPOs and obviously become a big, big organization, right? But again, uh, I would still say this is not a very, I would say a recommended path, but it is, it is, a, it is a path for what most startups take. With that, I, I am done with my presentation for the day. I hope this has really helped you. This has really in, give, given you some information, some insights, and perhaps uh, uh, inspired you as well. I would like to now invite Dan to talk about the next topic, which is on the passion and doable balance. Then the stage is all yours. Great. Thank you so much. That was an awesome. Um... If anybody can't hear me, let me know. Um, so I'm gonna give everybody a break for a brief moment from looking at slides. And I'm just gonna speak for a couple of moments. And I'm gonna try to keep my presentation to about um, 10 to 12 minutes. So we'll, we'll go fast. Um, so again, as I mentioned, I'm Dan Riley. I am the co-founder of Radical. I am in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And at Radical, really fast, what do we stand for? What's our purpose? And there's a reason I'm telling you this, being an entrepreneur, um, we believe in inspired change. We believe in the power of radical thinking, and we believe in tolerance and trust and empathy and connection and courage and transparency. Um, and we believe in celebrating everything about each other. And that's how we create incredible organizations, incredible culture, incredible businesses. So one thing I want to start with before we get going, I want to interact a little bit with all of you. You've been on, been with us for an hour and a half, and I so appreciate your, your time spending two hours on um, different time zones. It's probably 
uh, in the evening where many of you are. So I just want to ask a real simple question. How are you doing? And I ask this to our to our amazing speakers as well. So are you, uh, and I'm going to give three, three responses. I'd like to hear three responses. I'm green. So if you're green, I'm feeling great. Life is good. You know, every, everything's good. I'm, feel, I'm feeling healthy, happy. Yellow, it's okay. Could be a little bit better. Um, kind of, you know, somewhere in the middle. And red, things aren't so good. And I and I bring this up because this is a trusted community where we're talking to uh, together. And I hope that maybe after this session, anyone who's red or yellow might be a little more green. So please enter in. How are you feeling? Red. All right, we have one red. Now that's um, let's see what we can do to get you to yellow. Um, anybody else? Red. Red. Oh, okay. A couple reds. Yellow. All right, Tina, fantastic. Yellow. Any, anybody else want to share? Well, thank thank you for sharing. I, I'm sorry to hear about about the those of you who are red. Um, reach out to friends, family. Take time for yourself. Right, breathe, relax, enjoy the weekend. Those who are green, fantastic. Stay green. Uh, have an amazing weekend. Those who are yellow, hopefully you'll be green by the end of this presentation. Um, so I, I want to, we've been talking a lot about, and I am going to move to slides, I, I promise, in a moment. <laughs> we've been talking a lot about entrepreneurship, and I'm going to, um, I've been doing this, and I've been, I've been labeled a serial entrepreneur um, in my life, and I, I just want to kind of put a really simple definition for all of you, because it sounds like from Floyd's survey, which I loved, the majority of you are, are wanting to be or are or are planning to move into an entrepreneurship role or try something or experiment with something. But the number one thing about being an entrepreneur is believing in something bigger than yourself. So please remember that. That's why we do, that's why we create. That's why we create something. That's why we bring people together. That, that's why we bring ideas and bring them forward because we want to change things. We, we, we believe in something that is bigger than who, than who we are. It, it, being an entrepreneur isn't about a, a selfish cause for oneself. Being an entrepreneur is about believing in actually making a difference, making an impact in the world we, we live. And I, and I'm asked often and I speak um, to a lot of entrepreneurs and I mentor a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs. I'm asked, well, what's the, what's the formula? What's the magic formula? And the very simple answer I give, it's 25%. This is very simple, please. This, there's no perfect math here. <laughs> it's 25% timing, 25% idea, and 50% execution. So it is about the execution, the work, the commitment. And we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about skills in a moment, skills that really allow some of the best entrepreneurs that, that I know and some of the best teams that work in small startups, new ideas to execute at the highest level. But of course, you have to have the right idea and timing is so crucial to this as well. Um, and you know, I want to quote one one of my favorite, um, and I'm sure many of yours, uh, um, Steve Jobs, of course. Something he he said once is um, sometimes life is going to hit you in the head with a brick. <laughs> Don't lose faith. So any of you who are thinking about this or starting this um, or starting this journey, you will be you will be hit. And it might feel like a brick, but never lose faith. And, and I will say this as well. Um, try to eliminate the word failing from your vocabulary. It's falling. If you fail, you fail. It's over, right? Falling means you can get back up. So 
as you're thinking through this and going through the journey, accept that you're going to fall, accept that you're going to trip. If you don't, you're not, you're not actually, you're probably not going to succeed. You have to fall, you have to trip. And then you surround yourself with incredible people who can lift you back up. So um, I wanted to start with, with, that, with that opening. And with that, I will share a few slides. Um, and do you want to launch your poll now? Yeah, in a moment. I'm just going to um, give me, so we, we should. Great. Can, can you see my slides? Perfect. Perfect. So yeah, in a moment, we'll, we'll, we'll launch a, um, a, uh, a poll, but I, I first want to start by talking about skills. And you, all of you, we hear about skills. We talk about skills all the time. We use words like power skills and soft skills and technical skills. Um, I like to talk about human skills. As an on entrepreneur, this is the most important thing. Um, and I wanna talk about the, real the fact that they are needed for success and they are absolutely critical to the long play. And everyone's talked about the long play, the long-term commitment. Um, and these human skills actually allow you to succeed with that long play. If you're focused on short-term, a quick in and out, being an entrepreneur, you, you tend to focus on more of the, the technical. You tend to focus on more of the financial which is critical and important, but you have to take that macro step back and you have to think about the human skills. Who do you represent? What do you stand for? What's the purpose? And we're gonna talk about that in, a, that, that in a little bit as well, the purpose of your organization, why you exist. Um, um, you know, at the end of the day, what are you leaving behind? What is your biz business doing? Um, and the reason why we're using a guitar and music in some of this is the best artists actually create art or music or film or a painting or whatever art that you might be involved in that they believe in that they want to see they want to listen to they want to hear they're not following trends about what's going to sell what's on the charts what's popular they're actually creating music for themselves because it because they believe in it they believe actually doing something that they believe in and they're passionate about will give them and create more success. And if it doesn't, at least they're happy, right? They're, they're creating something that's meaningful to them. So, so it's rebelling against the status quo to some degree and not following the trends. Learn from the trends always. So any, anybody going into to entrepreneurship, learn, 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 keep learning, understand where mistakes were made. But, but ultimately, as everyone said so eloquently today so far, you know, stay consistent, stay focused, um, and create something that inspires you, because then, and only then, can you inspire those around you. You have to be inspired yourself. You have to wake up and be absolutely committed to what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, so with this, um, there's a lot of skills that we can we can talk about from an entrepreneurial standpoint. Some of them, and I'm gonna quickly go through a list and then I'm gonna focus on what I call the five C's. But some of them, as we know, um, communication, you have to be able to communicate, creativity, innovation, adaptability, you have to be able to adapt and, and learn and adjust. Um, leadership, right? Being in a leader that is empathetic, that is humble, um, but also also very um, you know decisive, right? The, the, the best leaders, and, and we have this the, this unfortunate feeling that to be a great leader, you need to be powerful and lack empathy, and you always need to the, know the answers. That's BS. <laughs> Please, any anybody who thinks that's what a great entrepreneur or great leader is, rethink it. Uh, the best leaders are those who actually reach out to people around them who, who accept mentorship, who accept new ideas. The best ideas come from people who you surround yourselves around. Um, networking, this came up earlier as well. Um, persistence, like these are, these are all incredibly important um, skills. And of course, as a entrepreneur, you do have to surround yourself or have skills in the financial management of a business. 
and we're going to talk about that as well in a bit. Um, the marketing side of a business. I mean, these are important skill sets being an entrepreneur, but I want to focus on the five C's. And these are, as you can see on the screen, committed, caring, courageous, so being, and I'll talk about what I mean by, by courageous in a moment, consistent and calm. So let's start with, with being committed. Um, like I said, that Steve Jobs quote, sometimes life's going to hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. You have to stay committed and keep going. Um, and being committed is being, or being committed to those people you surround yourself around. And that means um, sharing where you're at, sharing the success of the business, um, sharing, um, you know, if, if we're hitting turbulence, share with your team, don't shoulder it, don't hold on to it. Don't think you can fix it yourself. You can't, you can't fix it yourself. You need to surround yourself with great people. That's going to be a constant theme. Caring, and this goes hand in hand, care about your people. We all know people are, are any organization's greatest asset. I hate even using that language and asset and using it in the same sentence as when we talk about people. Um, but they are, people are what make great organizations. So as an entrepreneur, empower your people, like give, give them a, a seat in, in, in the conversation, especially when you're small and you're starting and you're, you have new ideas and you're percolating ideas. Overcare, always overcare. Be courageous. And something about being, being courageous is important that I, I typically talk about being brave enough to be courageous. Because sometimes being courageous is, 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 is really scary, right? You have, you have to make moves that you're not comfortable with. You have to make decisions that are tough and challenging. And this came up a few times. But to do that, you need to be brave. You need to be brave that you might fall. And I'm not using the word fail here. You might fall from time to time. So you have to be brave enough to fall. And that is courage at its best. Consistency. Consistency is so important. Any entrepreneur, you have to stay consistent. So articulate your purpose. Be consistent with your purpose. Don't pivot your idea based on fear or trends around you. Now, absorb them. Learn from them. Right, And you might need to pivot from time to time. I'm not suggesting never pivot, but don't pivot based purely on fear or somebody else or some competitor or some other idea is doing this, so I better do this. And, and you sort of lose the focus on, on what, why you started it to begin with, what you believe in. So stay consistent. And then um, stay calm. And Floyd, I really appreciate what Floyd said. Don't sacrifice yourself and your health and your family and your friends. Um, so you have to stay calm for yourself. You need to stay grounded for yourself. There's a reason when you're on an airplane, um, if something were to happen and an oxygen mask comes down, they always say before helping others, put the oxygen mask on. Otherwise you're useless to everyone around you, right? You have to take care of yourself first. Um, and that requires a great deal of, of just calm, cool, collected. And so these are what I believe when we talk about human skills and entrepreneurship, stay committed to your purpose, right? Care, care so much, care so hard about your people and what you're doing and why you're doing. And of course, care about your customers and your clients. Be courageous and be brave. Be consistent, consistent, always be consistent with, with communication. Don't create alternative messages to different Stakeholders of different groups, be consistent and stay super calm and cool and take care of yourself. It's so important. Um, I do want to keep this, it's 11.05, so I do want to keep this um, kind of uh, short short here. So um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into to mergers and acquisitions part, part of this, and I'm not going to get into too much detail here. I Please, I want everyone to know um, every entrepreneur goes through a lot of different considerations around how do I fund my, my idea? Um, should I take on seed money now? Should I invest my own money? Should I be bootstrapped? These are all decisions that you need to talk to your advisors around, your comfort level around. 
Um, so, so surround yourself with great people who can give you feedback there. So anything that, that I tell you um, in my history and my past, I've gone, I've done this multiple ways. I've done it the, the one dollar at a time approach, one client at a time approach, and I've done it where I have gone out and raised money. It really depends on where you are, your comfort level. Um, but but please get feedback, get advice. Any of us on on this panel, I'm sure, would be happy to to help give you some advice. So please reach out to any of us um, about that as well, or reach out to your network um, to help with this. Uh, I will say, um, every entrepreneur typically thinks about an exit, right? Or at least, what am I doing? How long am I going to do this? Is it a five-year plan? Is it indefinite? I urge you all to, to, to not be too caught up on what the ending looks like and stay focused on what the beginning looks like and feels like. Um, that's my first piece of advice. If you're, if you're focused on the outcome, whether it's financial purely or whether it's some time frame purely, um, it's you've probably heard the this this conversation. It's not a finite game. Business isn't finite. It's infinite. I mean, you're going to constantly um, you can't control timing. You can't control. I'm going to exit in five years. Someone's going to acquire my my company or you can't control. I'm going to acquire a company along the way three years in. You have to let this be a little more organic, a little bit more natural. And when that does happen and when you do, do get to the point of. Um, maybe letting go of your organization or, or bringing another company in. Um, culture is so important. And I, I, you'll see the quote on the screen, culture eats acquisitions for breakfast. Obviously a play on what you've all heard before, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And culture, uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, culture as we know it is really, it's defined as um, our beliefs, um, our belief system, right? How it feels to be a part of an organization, not just what we put on a piece of paper, but how does it feel every day? What's my experience? Um, the values of, of an organization, the assumptions, the perceptions, all of this feeds into culture. Anytime you move in or you, uh, you, you go through an acquisition or you acquire someone, the success of that, regardless of how good the business idea is to come together or to be merged together without um, without thinking about culture and how are we going to to actually come together as one the idea of one plus one equals three or one plus one equals four is so critical and that can make or break the the best acquisitions um a personal story real fast try to keep it to 30 seconds here I, when i acquired uh, sold my last company and it was acquired um it was a massive success story because we cared so hard about, about the culture. And um, one mistake I made, and I, I talk about this, is I told my team, my people, we had such a beautiful culture that we built. I, they were all worried, is it going to change? Is our culture going to change? And I remember saying, it's not really going to change. You know, we're, Our culture is going to actually... The, a big reason we're being acquired is because of our technology, but of course, our culture as well. What I failed to say and what I learned, um, and I'm always learning, is what happened was we created even a better culture between a combination of what they had and what we had. So you have to make you have to be careful. It's you can never retain your own culture through any type of acquisition, uh, acquisition or merger. But what you can do is take the best of who you are and take the best of who they are and create something even better. It's like a relationship. If you think you're not going to change, and we all know this, right? Like, I'm going to stay everything about me. I'm going to be exactly the same. I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to change. Your relationship's probably not going to work all that way. The best relationships are those who are willing to just uh, to, to alter a little bit, right? And to change a, a little bit and, and, um, and come together and find ways where we're better together, right? And when you can be better together, you can create something that's again, the one plus one equals three, that's success. And then uh, finally, um, I wanna end with, and I think we we can skip the polls, but maybe we'll do a quick poll at, at the end, one of them. Um, yeah, should I launch? But, yeah, let, let's do the, the the first one. And then, I'll, then I'm gonna end with the, this really critical 
area talking about purpose and vision. So let, let's launch the, the first poll around what's most important, uh, at least from the audience perspective, or what do you believe is most important around the five C's that I talked about. So what's the most important human skill of being an entrepreneur? If you had to check, yeah, commitment, great. Anybody else? Good. Good, good, good. You know what I wanted to see in this is a pretty much a, there is no right answer. <laughs> it should be relatively equal. Um, and this is kind of what I'm seeing. But you know what? I do like that commitment is taking the lead because at the end of the day, being committed to anything you do, again, personal goal, relationship, um, change in your life, um, commitment sort of encompasses and drives everything. And and because without commitment, um, everything else is sort of secondary. So I love this. But again, caring, courageous, consistent, calm, those are, are I love that they're all made the list. So exactly what I was hoping to see. Um, so I'm going to end just quickly talking about the shared purpose and in, in, in vision, um, more specific to I'm going to talk about this in the context of being an entrepreneur, but also around mergers and, and acquisitions. So number one, and this came up through all the speakers today, um, stay focused on what, what you believe in. Don't, again, don't change your ideas based on noise. Be really careful to what you absorb and what you hear from a noise perspective. That doesn't mean don't take great ideas and listen, listen, and listen to your trusted um, peers that you surround yourself around, your team that you surround yourself around. Um, but it's so important that you do keep that that shared purpose of, of, of why do I do what I do and why did I create this idea? Right, like so. Again, that why is ultimately what's going to keep your company and your long play and your success alive. And then with that, your vision and and a vision is a purpose is is a much larger why. A vision sort of can can be a part of how are we going to get there. Um, you know, what are we ultimately trying to change? What and what do we stand for? And and so really articulating your vision so important as as well and whether it's being going through an acquisition on the back end or acquiring make sure these things are all in line never um you know never sell out what you believe in the best entrepreneurs um uh, that i've met in my life and some of the, the most famous that we all know about will would tell you that same advice um, and I'll, I'll end with a really fast quote. Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. And this was a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King. And I think this is so critical. So for all of you just stepping into this, have faith, take that first step. You don't need to see the whole staircase. You don't need to have the whole business plan <laughs> mapped out. You can jump into it with passion, be committed, be caring, be courageous, be consistent, stay calm, take care of yourself. And um, you will succeed and you'll be happy succeeding. That's just and equally as important. So thank you, everyone. And I'll turn it over to my friend, Marcus, who I'm sure will dazzle us with his, with his presentation. Thank you, Dan. Let's stop sharing my screen. Okay. So, okay, then I will share my screen. And um, thanks a lot for still staying with us. It's quite a long time now, and, and I'm the last speaker today. So thank you for being here today with us. It's, it's really a pleasure to, um, yeah, to present here today and to talk also something about startups, about entrepreneurship. And... Um, I'm involved in several startup projects, so, so um, in, in different directions, in technology areas, in, in consulting areas, and, and also in a student platform. I will tell later a little bit more about that. And 
I have thought before what is describing best the startup world. So, so what is a picture for the startup world? And I, I found this quote from Ray Hoffman, and it says, starting a company is like jumping off a cliff and assembling the plane on the way down. And that, that's exactly how it is. So you start something and you don't know what's happening. You need to do so many things in parallel. You need to care about so many things. You work on your, on your product. You work with customers. You work in sales. You work in marketing. You work in, in, in so many areas that it's nearly overloading. So it's a, a crazy world. It's a crazy time to really build something like that. But um, it's also a lot of fun. It's it's different than than being in a normal job, and it's it's um, a, a big experience, I believe. And I will tell you a short story about yeah, why is it important um, yeah to ask? And and um, there is a story, a famous one, perhaps you know it, about Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs called Bill Hewlett when he was twelve years old, and Bill Hewlett's phone number was at that time still in the phone book. And he called Bill Hewlett and, and said to him, I want to build a, a frequency counter and I need some spare parts for that. And can you give me some spare parts? And interestingly, he laughed and said, yes, of course, I give you some spare parts. And he even gave him a summer job at Hewlett Packard. And um, that was a big moment for, for Steve Jobs in his life. And I, uh, it's also a moment where he noticed what really matters for being successful as an entrepreneur, and that is asking. So just ask people and talk with people, call with people, um, make your network. And um, it, it's, it's even he even believed that this separates um, the people who do things from the people who don't do things that separates the people who just dream from the people who really bring something on the ground. And I think a, a very nice story about entrepreneurship and about getting started and, and building a startup. Um, I come now to the part, yeah, what, what is needed for an entrepreneur? And I think we have heard about that already a lot. And so I don't want to go to into details here, I, I just want to mention main some for me some very main and important points, and that's passion, that's um, vision, and direction. And very important, in my opinion, is that you really have passion for, for what you do. So don't do something you don't like. Don't do something just for money or for doing a startup. So you need the passion, you need the, the energy and, and the passion gives you the energy to go forward and to grow. And, and that's very important um, for building a startup. And always have in mind these, these um, Northern star, this vision. So there is an idea you have, there is something you want to do in life. You want to change something in the world with your startup. And that's always what you should look forward to and always have in your mind. And that's really, really important. Um, I don't go in the other details. I think we have talked about that um, and the other speakers have talked about that already. So let's jump over that. I have also now another, um, yeah, another point. Yeah, we, we have discussed also that, but uh, interestingly, I have another study and we've seen today several studies in this direction. And that's very interesting to see now that also different studies have different outcomes. And I, I have a study from Bill Gross and um, Bill Gross um, has founded a lot of startups. Perhaps you know him. He has founded uh, more than 100 startups and he has also analyzed um, more than 100 additionally, what's the success factor of these startups? And he mentions these points, these five points. Um, it's the idea, it's the team, it's the business model, it's the funding, and it's the timing. And 
I will show you how we analyze that. So it, it looks like this, and these are some very famous examples like Airbnb, like Instagram, Uber, YouTube, LinkedIn. And as you see, they, they have um, succeeded. They, have, they are now big companies, very famous companies. And um, then other ones like Webvan, Cosmo, Pets.com, Flues, Friendster, they have disappeared. They are just not there anymore. And what he did is he analyzed more than 200 of these companies and made a rating and, and analyzed what are the main points, why have some succeeded and why some not. And as I said before, this is another study. We have seen other ones before. And interestingly, this study has other outcomes. So number one reason why startups succeed is in that case, tame, timing. And he says timing is that important for startup because um, you, you are in a, in a certain time of, um, of the market. That means you are in a boom market or you are in a recession and your idea matters extremely in, in, in the time. So for example, if you look at Airbnb, it was a time where it was from business side really hard. So a lot of people were um, renting their rooms and, and that made them such a big start in the end. And that's why he says timing is number one. Then the team, the execution, we heard it before, the team matters, the execution matters. The idea is, is only number three, the business model only number four, and funding is the last one. And um, interesting to see, I think most people think of other um, topics on top, especially the idea and the business model, but business model change and ideas also are changing. So that's why, there are always opportunities to, to adapt. And what I want to do with uh, my presentation, going deeper into the business model and um, talking about the business. So what are you doing when you build a startup? It's a, it's a lot of work. It's a, a big thing you're doing. So you build your business plan, you build your financial plan, you build a legal structure, you build um, your branding, your marketing, you, you create your team, your, your product. Of course, it's very important to have a, a good product and, and, and also perhaps already get funding, perhaps in a later stage, but you can't do everything. So it's, it's a real challenge. It's really big work. And you notice then when you go into the market, Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that's also some experience from my side. Um, you can be perfectly prepared, but in the end, the customer tells you something else. And in the end, everything can change. So it's, it's really, it really can be completely different as you have expected it for. So what can you do? You, you work in another way, you work more agile. You work more in the way like including the customer everywhere and working with the customer and working close with the customer. And um, this is an other approach and an other idea behind, but also there it's, it's not a guarantee for success because also there change is the only constant. And um, also customers adapt and also customers change. And that's what I want to show you now with um, some slides, with some um, experiences, which I made with one of our startups, um, how we changed our business model in quite a short time and um, how our customers are influencing the business model. And I want to tell you more about um, this company, it's Quarero. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's our student platform. What are we doing here? We connect students and companies. So that means you have you have a problem as a company. You have a task as a company. You put that into this platform, and we match you with the perfect student worldwide. That can be um, something like a, a marketing concept. That can be programming work. That can be anything, and. Um, 
it helps the students to get practical experience and of course companies get their, their work done and have potentials to hire future employees. And what we did there, and, and that's um, quite a while ago now, some years ago, we started with the idea to have really a very scientific platform. So the idea was we focus on scientific projects and on PhD students. And where did it come from? One of my co-founders, he has a PhD in, in chemistry. And so the idea come, came from that side. And we said, let's focus on that. And we worked with customers on that. And what happened was the first customers came and, and said to us, that's nice, that's good. We need science people. We need um, chemists and, and um, biology people and, and with PhDs, but we also have the need for IT students. We, we need marketing students. We need law students. We need different kind of people. And PhD is nice, but we could also use master and bachelor students. So can you help us also on that side? So, so we changed that business model and said, okay, we, we work also with you on, on these other directions. What happened was then, and that's the next step. Um, yeah, the company said, yeah, um, you, you are now a kind of fiver or upwork for students, but we have some challenges with the payments. We have challenges to pay people in, in Central Africa or people in, in certain countries of Asia. Can you help us with that? We, we can't do that um, correct and it's, it's not working always. So can you build something on that? And what we did is, yeah, we, we built another payment process. And um, we also changed the payment in terms of you get only one invoice as a customer in every month instead of paying all students separately. So it changed again. And I want to tell you another example. And then that's um, the, the, the service as, uh, let's say, from coming from a self-service model into a more full service model. We started with a complete self-service model. This means companies could book their students how they want it. And they, they did already that. And they do it also. And the, the small companies still do it. But there were a lot of companies who said, I, I want to have full service. Can you help me managing also the student? So that means, can you select a student for me? Can you um, perhaps even manage the project for us? And so we developed a service, a full service. So at the moment, we have four example, and that's one example, a full service for social media management, like LinkedIn management with um, creative students because the customers were um, pushing for that. And that's an example I just want to show you um, yeah, how business models can change and how you change your thinking just on learning together with your customers what their problems are and following their problems and their needs and, and um, yeah, just, just one direction. And I want to mention one more point and, and um, that's a very important point for me. We heard that several times also today. And um, yeah, that's, that's the point of time. It always takes longer than expected. And, and that's a, a post from Gary Vaynerchuk, a, a very famous um, entrepreneur, as you know, and, and um, very successful person. And um, he says, there is no overnight success. You need time. And, and he writes, it may happen seven years, um, but get started, do it, um, keep going. And um, yeah, that's my, my point of the day. And I hope you enjoyed this session. I, I will skip the poll because of the time also. So um, yeah, I think we have a little bit of time for questions and um, then um, yeah, I'm curious to hear something and some fe feedback from you. Great, Marcus, excellent presentation. Uh, so we'll quickly, tomorrow being Easter, let's just quickly rush into the Q&A. Uh, so I think I see about two questions here. 
The first one is, do you have any sites or places where you could get crowdfunding or best tips to get investors? So who wants to take the first go at that? So my, I, I can just take that real fast. I, um, so my, my first, I, again, I always urge everyone, be careful to, to take too, too much money too early on. Um, if you're just looking for kind of seed money to get going, I would recommend if you can, um, your first, um, I guess, tier of people should be friends that you know, maybe other entrepreneurs or other business owners, um, then typically you're not giving away 10, 20% of your, of your company before you even get going. So, so be careful. There is some crowd, of course, some kind of um, crowdfunding you can do. So there's some good sites there. I'd be happy to share some of that. But, um, you know, um, be steady and slow in the beginning um, as far as taking on too much money. Uh, reach out to people that you know and trust. That would be my recommendation to kind of get seed money to get going. Second question is, um, would you suggest, a, that's from Annika, would you suggest a startup with your friends or otherwise? Any tips if you start with friends? So Marcus, Pankaj, do you want to? Yeah, I, I can tell a little bit about that. So I have um, in, in, yeah, in several of my projects, friends involved. <laughs> and yeah, it, 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 it's um, sometimes I even met people and I have one startup, I have a person involved. I met only two weeks ago physically. I knew her only virtually. So it's a, it's a person from India even, and I have to say it works. So it's um, often a, a trusted relationship and um, you know the people for a longer time and you know how they are. I, I have several people involved, um, which worked with me in the past in, in, in corporates. And um, that was always positive from my side. Uh, just to add to what uh, Marcus said, right? Uh, don't just don't just look for friendship as a criteria. I would say, I mean, yeah, definitely agree that trust is is a lot important. But at the same time, <clears throat> you should look for what value each of you bring uh, on the table when you get into that partnership, right? So I would just add to that with with all the trust and friendship, yeah. It, it, yeah, and just to add on to that that as well, I my last my my last two companies I've done with my brother. So there was somebody asked me, oh, wow, that must be fun <laughs> with, um, with, with siblings. Um, but we, what we found is we actually brought in a, a third partner in both cases, and that helped balance out the, the brotherly uh, thing. I, I, I think I am in love um, that just make sure you're not making decisions purely on who your friends are, because typically all you're doing are, are these are people who already agree with what you believe in in many cases. So debate gets harder. Decision making can be more complicated. That's not always true. Sometimes friends can be really good at separating friendship and business. And um, so just be upfront and honest and transparent with, with whether it's friends, someone you met, whether it's family. That's the most important part. So there, there is another question. What if I don't have any friends with the skills needed for executing an idea? including myself. <laughs> I mean, that's, what if I don't have any friends? Okay. Well, uh, well, well I, I would add, uh, including to the previous one, you know, if you have friends and you want to have a good time with friends, go on a holiday. <laughs> don't start a business because unless they share <laughs> your vision, your passion and your values, only then they're good enough to take together because sometimes our decisions get distorted by our relationships rather than our business priorities. So if you don't have friends, it's a good starting point as well. You yeah. can find the right people to begin your venture. 
Yeah, I mean, real simply put, yeah, people come together on, on, based on an idea that will change things. So find people who believe in your idea. Don't don't worry about if they're friends or not. Um, if they are friends, like we talked about, you know, make sure you 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 separate friendship from from business. But um, find people who who are passionate about what you believe in. Yeah, and also uh, to the person, uh, to, uh, to Aaron, who asked about what if I don't have friends? There are so many sole uh, proprietorships. There are just so many you can do it just on your own. So I don't think that should be a major block for you. You can do it. You can start something and you can be the sole owner if you don't have friends. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I think that is better because then you don't have to... Uh, constantly dialogue and you know you could think very differently from the other person and then there's finances involved so that could be sometimes a better option if i may add you also should be careful of false friends uh, for example uh, in our situation uh, there are a few pharmaceutical companies that were willing to invest in us because of the work we were doing but the condition was we would exclusively only recommend their products. So we said, thank you, but no thanks. So just make sure what are you, what are they asking in return? Don't sell your soul for a profit. That's what I would say. Absolutely. Okay, now the same person says, I mean, uh, I meant it's nice to have an idea, but you need people with the skills. So you could have an idea, but you also need people who have the skills to execute those. It's not just uh, friends, but also friends with skills, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, and that's kind of when we talked about skills. I mean, there, there are technical and specific skills, but I will again um, say this, at the end of the day, um, skills that, that, are, that are committed and, 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 and caring and, and you know, consistent. I mean, these are the type of skills you need in an entrepreneur and these are the type of skills that you need in team. Technical skills, things like that, can can be learned pretty quickly in many cases, uh, depending on what you're doing. But again, you can't really learn the skill of passion, the skill of, of commitment. These are just characteristics that you want to surround yourself around. These are people that you want with you, um, people who you can trust, who you can believe in when times get tough, people who can pick you up when times get rough. Right? The other skills will come and go, but this other foundational stuff is so key. And yes, we could definitely send you the slides. Aaron, if you could just post your email ID or WhatsApp number, we could send you the slides. Okay, I think uh, we've answered the questions and it's getting late, it's Easter tomorrow. So, uh, so should we... Um, does anybody in the audience want to ask anything else? Do you want to join the discussion? And those who are busy and who want to log off for Easter could, uh, you know, uh, continue. Is there anything else that we want to talk about? Uh, there are some more chats coming in. Uh, okay, so Aaron's given his email ID. I'll just I'll just state I hope those few of you um, who stated you were read. I, I hope, um, take care of yourself. You know, uh, I hope you can find some, some yellow or green, um, you know, in the next few days. Um, always, you know, ask for help when you need it, reach out to friends, just take, take care of yourself. Cause I always, um, I, I always hate to, to see that when those are read and hopefully, hopefully the session together maybe brought a little light into your day. Good. I think I'm not sure if we lost. But, oh, there you are, busy. Yeah. So uh, I think I think that's about it. So uh, is uh, there? I was just going strolling through the chats to see if there is anything else. A lot of uh, a lot of people have said that they liked it. Thanks to all the presenters for a great presentation. And 
Yes, so we didn't want to extend the time because of Easter, but we I think we had an amazing uh, amazing talk. We are not uh, we are not authorities. We are not uh, extremely skilled, but all all on the panel are entrepreneurs themselves. So I think that talks by itself. So we would like to take a break now. I mean, we'd like to call it off. And these are one of our enlightening episodes. And soon we would have we would have said before you something more, and something probably different and unique, just like our other episodes. And thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience. You've been an amazing audience. Thank you so much for your chats, your questions. And we do look forward to seeing you again. And happy Easter to everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.